you. My name is Bill Smith, and I'm the chair of uh, this session. It's a pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dan Frenkel, who is my thesis advisor. And uh, I think his hobby is talking about entropy, but in this particular time, entropy has probably uh, made a big jump from going from materials to COVID. So curious to find out how that's related to entropy. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. It, it, it looks like a bit of an incestuous relationship between the, the, the chair and the speaker, as I was chairing Erica's talk. But uh, <laughs> um, first, I should like to, to thank, uh, of course, first uh, uh, Sheikh, uh, 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 Sheikh Saud uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the RACCAM advisory board uh, for allowing me to speak here. And, and yesterday, uh, uh, when... Uh, 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 Sir Todi gave his talk, he said that he, he would give a general talk and then at the same time hopefully try to convince his peers that he hadn't lost the plot. I have no, no such hope. Um, <laughs> uh, because I will, I will be com sort of talking about something where basically I know nothing. <laughs> uh, but in, in this particular case, actually, I think it, it helps me not uh, being an expert because you, you come at the subject with a, with, a, with a fresh view. So this uh, is a few pictures that I'll come back during, later during the talk, so I will not say much about it now. Uh, but uh, two years ago, almost to the day, um, well, two days, uh, it was 24th February, I, I gave a talk at, at the IVAM meeting in 2020, and uh, at that time, my last slide, more or less, was this. It was about a, a virus attaching to a cell. And, uh, of course, we all already knew about the coronavirus, and we all knew that it could, spread, uh, by, could be spread by people without symptoms, so there was every reason to be worried. But, of course, uh, we did not know yet how bad things would be. And... Uh, and so uh, in, for, for a few weeks, we were living in a kind of phony world where things seemed to be continuing as if everything was normal. And I, I can't resist showing you what happened uh, three weeks later when I thought, so what is the University of Cambridge doing? And so the Cam University of Cambridge has its own uh, publication, the, 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 the Reporter. And so um, I, I typed in COVID in the in the search and report to see if there's anything being said, giving us instructions. So here is my 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 search. So you see, it says COVID, and the university, the search machine started to, start to look everywhere to see if any announcements had been made. And then it turned out that actually the University of Cambridge is a very classical university because it says, oh sorry, no results found. Did you mean Ovid? <laughs> Uh, this, this, is, this is unfortunately completely true. I mean, uh, <laughs> um, then uh, after that, of course, things went fairly quickly, and because this is on the 11th of March, and then this is the 14th of March in, uh, in Cambridge, all masks sold out. This is the pharmacy, more or less around the block from, uh, from the chemistry department. And, uh, and okay, I, I then traveled to the Netherlands, but. We, we all knew, or know what, what basically happened. I mean, so this is a, a snapshot I took uh, from the, the air traffic in the Netherlands during the lockdown. You will not see that again in your lifetime, I hope. <laughs> this was a, a picture I took when I actually last year took one of the first opportunities to travel to the Netherlands from the UK by ferry. There were no flights. And I was the only foot passenger on this huge ferry. Uh, so, it was really something that affected us very, very strongly. Uh, at the same time, in the UK, they, they were, I mean, they were planning in March 2020 uh, to go for herd immunity based on the models of it, the Imperial College models by, by Ferguson, which, b by the way, is, uh, is a physicist and a very good one. So, uh, But I was discussing with Mike Cates, who is the Lucasian professor, um, about that... <laughs> There are, of course, many more models, and so we were concerned that the, the people would not be sufficiently uh, able to, to explore all the different 
uh, model predictions and so we and at the same time we talk to people who are on SAGE which is the government advisory committee on emergencies and they say we're too busy just running our models we can't actually keep up with the literature so then we decided to uh, to see how, how we could help and uh, by the way for those of you who don't know uh, my Kate's uh, Almost certainly during the past two years, you have been using a hand gel. And uh, let me see. And if you have been using a hand gel, think of Mike because he, he has been working a lot with Unilever basically on the, the technology of making water based gels that, that shear thin. Um, but I mean, that's of course not his main claim to fame, but <laughs> it's in this context important. Anyway, we, so what we did is we, we started the project volunteer based to do a kind of scientific crowdsourcing where people would scan the, the preprint literature we, because there were literally tens of thousands of preprints that would not appear in print for months at the time when really policy decisions would have to be made and we were not going to advise on policy but we just wanted to make sure that the information in a filtered form came to those who, who, who needed to take decisions so this is something that we uh, started first we discussed with Trinity and then actually to the, with the Royal Society the Royal Society kindly or that's actually Venki at the time kindly uh, helped us uh, uh, do this it was, uh, uh, and so it actually took only a week I mean I must say that was it was once it was launched it was within a week there was an agreement that we had this rapid assessment in modeling in modeling the pandemic called RAMP and, and I told Mike that that was a very nice acronym but not in the Netherlands and actually when we tried to do something similar in the Netherlands it failed completely because RAMP in the Netherlands means disaster uh, <laughs> uh, okay so uh, that, that is how we started and then after that uh, the people who volunteered and there, there were initially hundreds but in the end a few dozens who really did a lot of work we were reading well I certainly read between six and seven hundred preprints. Well, read. I mean, some fast, some slow. So you get a, 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 a big, a big picture of what people. It's not just the modeling. It was what goes into the models. And actually, one of the reasons why Mike asked me to be involved is because the modelers look at the mathematics, but they don't look at the, at the physical parameters that that go into the, the opposite. And so, uh, <coughs> the thing that that really struck me is that <coughs> it focused very much on the biomedical aspects of course the epidemiological things like what kind of model you do, do for the spread of the disease but n not much i would say almost nothing at all about the chemical physics of, of how viruses do their job how, how they become a successful virus and uh, that is basically uh, what I would like to talk about today, and it is actually related to the, the last slide of my talk two years ago, namely how uh, multivalency, the fact that these viruses have multiple spikes, can be important for the, 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 the spread of diseases like uh, the COVID, but actually for many others, <coughs> because almost all uh, pathogens have multiple ligands on the surface that they, they can use to connect to a cell. Uh, uh, there are many other topics that I, I've been reading about that are incredibly interesting. I'll just focus on this one because it actually relates also to things that I have been working on before. And uh, so I'll skip the rest. Um, now, one thing that I, I really uh, found depressing is that when you read the literature, uh, in particular, on, on the, all, everything having to do with the binding of the virus to cells, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, as if it's not medical or biomedical. So, if it's not like this protein likes that protein, but if there's anything a cooperative behavior, of, I would say the statistical mechanics of the phenomenon, there are no experiments. And so, I mean, and, and still not. And I, I actually, I think I, I can document that in a minute. Uh, but before I do, it, I'll first make <coughs> a few provocative statements. But why there was so little? Uh, first of all, uh, I've been interacting a lot with people in physics in particular uh, who've done wonderful work on the spread of aerosols. But uh, on the whole, certainly during the first year or so, they basically did not care what was inside the aerosol. So you can say, oh, small droplets spread. But then you say, how much is there in the small droplets? Can virus actually survive in the small droplets? How about the big droplets? So there are experiments 
that suggests that actually in droplets larger than five microns, there may be many viruses, but they don't seem to be viral. So there's, there's all kind of very sort of important data missing if you just look at how droplets spread. Um, so uh, they, they were not addressing the question of the, the chemical physics. Uh, this is an example. Here you see, uh, I, I looked at the web science, and science recently on <coughs> aerosol and SARS-CoV-2, whatever. And if I exclude all the medical papers, then I still get a thousand papers for the past two years. And these are published papers. Now, I continue provoking. There's been a huge amount of simulation, of course, because everyone wants to know uh, what binds to the spike protein. And this has been important for, the, for drug development optimization. Uh, but it's all about the individual spike protein binding to an individual receptor or to an individual drug molecule. And it is not focusing on, on, the, on the cooperative uh, phenomena. And again, I can document this uh, because I found not the same number, but over 400 publications until well, a week ago uh, on, on simulation of, of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and one on the effect, the cooperative effect, the multivalency. So it, it is, it is a, an underrepresented topic, and I think I want to explain why that is not a good idea, that you shouldn't ignore that. Point three, of course I'm not a virologist. So in the Netherlands in particular, the, the virologists were pretty angry if people from the other sciences said that they had something to say. They said, you don't even know anything about viruses, and so you should shut up. And uh, But they really, I mean, they, they don't particularly care about the physical chemistry, nor about the aerodynamics, nor about the statistics. So it, it is a, it, 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 the, uh, that community was also not going to address the question. And so, uh, having insulted now three groups, I think uh, that I have no friends left, and so I can, <laughs> I can cont continue with my talk. Um, <coughs> okay, so, uh, what do viruses Actually, I mean, viruses, <coughs> <coughs> sorry. viruses don't attack just any cell. They attack cells that, for them, are attractive targets. And they do that by recognizing certain uh, receptors that are overrepresented on the surface of that cell. So cells, I mean, this, this ACE2 protein that I'll mention in a minute, is overexpressed on certain types of cells. And that, that is something that we heard. Uh, extensively in the news over the coming over the past few years, and and once the virus has found a cell, then then it it it, it triggers a process by which which undergoes endocytosis, it gets into the cell. Uh, incidentally, that may be new to you, that uh, there's a Chinese study that shows that in order to start an infection, you need only one virus. I mean. Well, one virus that has successfully landed. It may mean that you may have inhaled many more, but if one lands, that can start the whole process. And I'm happy to tell more about that in a minute, but that's not the topic I, I'm focusing on. Anyway, so that's what they do. And, and the, uh, the receptor in the case of uh, the COVID is ACE2. And, and this is uh, uh, my very schematic representation of a virus. This is a PowerPoint virus. And this is a cell membrane, and here you have these receptors, and here you see the receptors uh, connecting to the virus. But that's, of course, not what happens, because on the whole, these are fairly weak interactions. And, and I'll explain in a minute why they have to be weak. And if, if, it, if it works, my animation will show what you will see in, in practice. So Namely, oh, I don't see it, but, well, I... No, I, I don't see it. Okay, so... Um, that is Murphy's law. Basically, in the original version, these things were going on and off independently. So they, they, they and uh, um, and so. The, but the, the the thing is that uh, there are many spikes, there are many receptors, and so most of the time, at least one or two will be bound. And the situation where nothing at all is bound is rare, and depending on the distance, of course, if you're very far away. Then of course, they're unbound, but uh, for a, a virus close to the surface, most of the time it will be bound to some receptors. Um, and I want to focus on that uh, because it, 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 it is, there's some very simple mathematics that tells you how, how to, to look at that problem. Uh, and so um, I, I consider here the, the situation where you 
uh, you have a virus at a fixed distance from the membrane. Of course, it's fluctuating, but let's say the mid-plane or something like that. And for that situation, this thing is fluctuating, <coughs> and it has, <coughs> it has a certain probability to be bound, and then one minus that probability is unbound. So that's, uh, I would say, algebra 101. And uh, then you can say, okay, uh, if you if you if you have these two probabilities, then you you want to have a measure to express uh, this probability in something that that makes mean sense to physical chemists, and that's typically the binding free energy. So you think the more negative the binding free energy, the stronger it, the larger the probability it will be bound. So you express the ratio bound to unbound in terms of this this binding free energy that defines the binding free energy. There's nothing nothing magical about it. It's not it's not a, a new uh, a new quantity. It's just rather than all the time writing P bound over P unbound, I just write this this binding free energy. Okay. Um, now the only thing is that I can now write the probability that one particular receptor uh, spike protein pair is unbound in terms of this free energy, and you see that, of course, if, it is, if this thing is very attractive, with large and negative, then the probability this becomes a huge number, and almost certainly it will be bound. So the unbound probability goes to zero. Now, what happens if you have not one receptor spike pair, but you have a large number? So, oh, sorry, there, there we have the, the probability. Sorry, I should have done the order different. If you have n receptors unbound, and now we make a, a simplifying assumption, and the simplifying assumption is that different receptors, uh, the spike pairs, bind and unbind. So if what happens here does not affect the probability of what happens there. So they bind and unbind independently, in which case the probability that they're all unbound is simply the probability that one pair is unbound to the power n, where the pa n is the number of, of, of things that connect. So this is if you have n spikes in contact with the virus, then this is the probability that they're all unbound. And that, that dependence, that very strong dependence on n is actually extremely important. And so, uh, uh, to show that, um, I, I will go to the situation where the binding strength is actually small. I mean, I, I, I overdo it now a bit, so I just say that if this probability is, is much less than one, so that, that, so that most, most likely it's, it's unbound, which is actually not really the situation, but it, it allows me to simplify a situation, uh, then in, in, I, I, I use one mathematical <laughs> approximation, and I say that one plus x is approximately e to the power x. And you say, why would I do that? Because, now I go back here, that means that I can write this one plus a small number as e to the power of that small number. And that, uh, that makes life easier, because that it means that the, the probability that they're all n unbound depends on the binding free energy and the number of receptors, but it, dep it depends extremely strongly. So if we look here, then you see here n in the binding free energy. And uh, there's two things to note about the expression. One is it depends doubly exponentially in the binding free energy. So a tiny tweak in the binding free energy gives you a huge effect on the probability that the virus is bound or unbound. So if, if people say there have been massive mutations in the virus, they may be in fact very small at this level, but it ends up in the exponent. So, so it, it is still a huge effect. So that is... Uh, uh, it's something that, that sounds like bad news, but it's also good news. At least I think it is good news, because it also means that if you have a very slight change in the conditions, some molecule that competes and that sort of suppresses the probability that things bind, you don't need much to actually make it much harder for a virus to bind. So, so I think that this, this is both bad news and good news, this, this, this strong dependence. Um, the other thing is, is, of course, the N. And... Uh, to, so it, it basically says that with binding, you don't look at the situation where half the receptors are bound and half are unbound, which typically in a kind of mean field argument is what you would be looking at. You look at the probability that nothing at all is bound or, or, or something is bound. And to, to explain that in a human example, uh, I thought the following. Suppose that you have a group of people who go together on a trip. And these days, if you want to go on a trip almost anywhere, you need your COVID tests as we want. And basically, if it's a very 
a group that of people who like to travel together, if one person has not done the test, then the trip is off. And so here you have a stewardess. I, I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't say that this is stewardess. It's a stu, steward, star, Q, whatever. Uh, <laughs> anyway, it, uh, and 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 this the, the this I call her still stewardess says, ladies, gentlemen, and others, of course, do you all have your COVID test certificate? And then hopefully people say, well, um, ah, oh, sorry. I mean, you need only one do not have the certificate and the whole thing is off. And that basically is why you get a very different dependence. So this doesn't depend on the probability, the average probability that people have a test. It just depends if only one doesn't have it, it's out. And that is the, the, the same thing with virus binding. Now, this is not yet what I would call multivalent binding. Uh, it, because the multivalent binding only comes into play if you, until now I said always, one spike protein, one receptor. But actually, you typically have spike proteins and many receptors. And it, it depends on whether the, the spike, the, basically the ligand is flexible and the receptors are mobile or, or immobile. But the simplest thing is to say we have these N spike proteins and we have mobile receptors. And it becomes almost well, like a, a normal chemical equilibrium. And, and I, I said, I skipped the math. And then what you get is that instead of having just this binding free energy, you get here the receptor concentration in the region of the, of the uh, where the, 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 the uh, uh, pr where the, the, uh, the virus is binding. And again, I make this approximation. And now you see that you have a dependence that nothing is bound, depends on the number of spikes. It depends on the receptor concentration exponentially, and it depends doubly exponentially in the binding free energy. Um, now, uh, this dependence on the receptor concentration is the reason why this virus, this COVID, but also other viruses and, and bacteria can distinguish between the cells they like and the cells they don't like, because it is a very, very sharp dependence. And uh, so, so now we have to take a human example where we can see this effect. So before we basically said, have people taken their test? That's a one-to-one -one decision. Person one has taken it or not taken it. And now we look at the, the probability that people test positive depending on how many viruses are circulating, because then the, the virus concentration would be the CR. And so we here have a teacher, um, and the teacher uh, knows that all the children in the class will have to be sent home, maybe it's no longer true, but it used to be true, if a single one tests positive. So he says, okay, children, today there's a one in a hundred uh, incidents of COVID, uh, and please tell me if you're taken, if you have a negative test today, and oh, well, sorry, that's what he asks, and then they say, hopefully, if my all tested negative. But of course, as the concentration goes up, the, 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 the variable concentration, that story changes. So again, I asked it, but now it's one in 10 rather than one in 100. And you ask it, and again. It, and, but this transition is very, very sharp, much sharper. So it, it is really, uh, it is not something that simply goes linearly with the virus concentration. I'll show you curves later, but it just means that now you have a very, so that's also why when you have a slight increase in the number of cases, you suddenly find that everything closes down. It is because this effect that you need everybody to test negative and and, and the, that probability decreases exponentially uh, with, with the concentration of the virus, or the, 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 the prevalence of the virus in this case. So that is, in, in to come back to the binding uh, situation, uh, is why if you have uh, and you have your virus and there's one cell that, that overexpresses your preferred receptor and other cells don't, what, what you want, don't want to do as a virus is to, to waste your time on these, you want to attach there. And with a single protein, say with a single spike, you can't do it. So in a, with a single spike, if, if you have here three uh, receptors and there seven, then the ratio of probability binding is simply three to seven. But if you have many spikes, the story changes because you, you get this very sharp dependence that I show here in this, this curve. So what you see here is, is one of those typical simulation pictures with bizarre units. 
but what you see here is the receptor density expressed in how many receptors there are in an area co corresponding to the cross-section of the virus. And this is the, the, the fraction that actually has absorbed. And the black circles indicate what you expect if there's a, a monovalent, a single spike that is responsible. And in order to get from 10% bound to 90% bound, you need an almost two orders of magnitude change in the concentration of the receptors. But if you have, for instance, 10 of these proteins binding, then you see that to go from 10% to 90%, you may need only a factor two or three. So it has, it has become much, much more sensitive to the concentration of the receptors. And that is actually what I think uh, is, is really important in, in understanding uh, how, how, how these things work and how you can control it. And the one thing that you can do to, is to quantify this. I mean, how important is this increase in slope? So typically, we look at the situation where you have 50% adsorbed of the virus, and we define then how this, this adsorption probability that I denote by theta, how it depends on the log of the number, so it's a log-log derivative. So basically, it, it tells you what the local power is, of whether it is linear or higher. And the higher this rate, this alpha, this d log theta, d log nr is, uh, the more multivalent you are in your response. And uh, I suggested that what I show here, this picture, that I have explained it, and I have to be brutally honest, I actually did not explain it because there's a number of steps in between that are as such simple and boring, but I'll just say, tell you honestly that I didn't tell it. Um, okay, now, uh, step back for a moment from viruses and other pathogens and, and, and think about humans, because what viruses can do, we can do too, I would hope. And so, uh, if you if you're work in the pharmaceutical industry and you want to target certain cells that overexpress certain receptors, we should be using this. At least that's what I feel. And uh, uh, the thing is that they don't. At least up till now, typically the, 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 so the preferred approach is let's find a, essentially a monoclonal antibody that binds extremely strongly to the target protein. But the thing is that if you have one cell that has a hundred of these, the, your target receptors and the other cell that has one, then the ratio with which you bind to the other ones is still, well, one in a hundred, but typically there are many, many more healthy cells than diseased cells, and so you get side effects. And that's not what you want. So I think that multivalency really should be used in, in drug delivery. Uh, there's one thing that I'll, I'll just briefly show is, is work that we did. Actually, it was at the beginning of the pandemic. It was not related and then picked up by, by news media locally as if it had to do with the pandemic. It was to use... Uh, this in in, PC, in in sort of genome testing. You know how they do with PCR tests. What they do is they they have you have a certain strand uh, in the viral DNA that is characteristic for the for the virus, and then you 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 just make a probe that has a complementary strand and it's usually two or three. So for instance, with Omicron, it binds only to two of the three. But I mean that's the normal thing. So you have a fairly long strand, you bind selectively. But it's not very robust, because in the case of, for instance, Omicron, uh, one of the, th the, the three strands no longer works. If instead of binding strongly to one particular strand, you bind more weakly to repeating units. So if you take, I mean, of course, if you have a single nucleotide, it repeats uh, ten thousands of times in a, in a viral genome. If you take strands of length 10 or maybe 20, you get thousands or, one hundred or hundreds. And you just look at the ones that are most prevalent, and then you, you basically coat your target with things complementary to that. And if then one of them is knocked out, it doesn't make a difference. And so this, this is why I think that, and so this is what we wrote in this PNAS paper, but it hasn't been tested yet, so it's all, it's all at this stage numerical. Um, this is a simulation that we did a long time ago, it was in the, in the context of DNA-coated colloids, just to show what happens. Now you, you think about this as a virus, think about this as a receptor, the red things, the green things of the virus, and this is if you have a single, uh, a, a single, well, say, spike protein or ligand, and you increase the receptor concentration by a factor uh, three in this case, and uh, 
and you see that more virus particles bind, but not many more. I mean, maybe a factor two or so, not even in this case. Now we do exactly the same, but now the, the same particle has instead of ten, one strong ligands, it has ten weak ones. So that the net overall strength is about the same, so they have, they, the 50% the, the bound probability is, is at the same point. You increase the, the concentration of the receptor by a factor three, and suddenly you see the number of bound viruses go up by an order of magnitude. This, I think, is what... Uh, our, our enemies, the, the SARS-CoV-2, uh, uses to target the cells they like. So that's a super selective. Now, this is all theory and simulation. Experiments in vivo, absolutely nothing. That is where I say experiments are totally lacking. But in the, in the, in the colloid and polymer science community, there have been a few experiments. I'll just briefly flash them to just show them. I mentioned this quantity that tells you the, the degree of super selectivity, this alpha. These are experiments by Galina Dubacheva. She already started about seven years ago, but this is a recent paper in JAX. And what you see here, uh, well, it's a bit too, too many, but you see here the receptor concentration, here this binding probability, and importantly what you see here is uh, this, this curve, which is essentially derivative, is this alpha parameter, uh, which for monovalent binding should be here, and it goes to two. You say, oh, that's not much, maybe it should be much more. But, I mean, of course, the theory was highly oversimplified, and this is already pretty nice. And, uh, and actually, the, so it's a, and it agrees well with the experiments. And I should say a bit about the system. What they looked at is a system where they had uh, a a ferrocene bound to a, uh, a supported monolayer, a double layer, and then uh, and, uh, and in this case, what was binding was actually a polymer functionalized with cyclodextrin. And so you see, all these things can bind independently, and you get a, a, a clear super selective behavior. Um, there's another more recent experiment uh, by Christine Lin Lin and Daniela Kraft in Delft, where they actually did the same thing with with uh, uh, colloids functionalized with, with DNA. And again, let me just rather than focus on the pictures, focus on these yeast curves. This is the same, the same parameter that indicates the super selectivity to so the, the log of the, the, the concentration bound versus the log of the receptor density. And you see that all these things go well above one, and then they collapse it. To higher concentration, you lose it. To lower concentration, you lose it. But there is a regime where you get this very super selective behavior. Okay, um, so if I were to translate it, what it means for, for the, the COVID virus, then I think it is extremely likely it's a multivalent binder. But I, again, it has not been tested in that way. Uh, that I think that that means that it targets cells with a high level of expression of the AS2. This, I think, is important, that small changes in the binding frequency give large changes in, in, the, in the binding probability. I mean, I, it, last time when I spoke, I said, what's the effect of fever? I mean, how can two degrees fever on, on, a, on a body temperature of around 300 Kelvin, a bit above, make such a difference? And, and, and the argument, I think, is that you don't need much to suppress multivalent binding. But okay, again, it's all speculation, unfortunately. Um, the other thing that is now important, that's what I'll talk about in the last few minutes of my talk, is that this binding probability has, has effect on the reproduction number. We have heard too much about this, reprodu this infamous R, but it, it doesn't just affect the reproduction number, it also affects what is called the overdispersion. And I have to say a bit about overdispersion, because that, you, you read everything about uh, different models like the susceptible, in exposed, infected, recovered, etc. models, and they just are mean fields differential equations. But um, what is very important is actually the distribution of how many persons are infected, uh, the distribution of the number of people infected by, by, by a particular carrier of the disease. And to explain that, I'll take an example from internet having to do with spam, if I can. Oh, I have to push the right button. Uh, so this is about overdispersion. If you look on internet and you, you check spam, it says 80% of all emails are spam. Now there are two possibilities. One possibility is that every one of you here in the room, you send four spam emails and one real email. 
Um, or the alternative is that some people send millions, which I think uh, is, 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 is what we, we, we tend to believe, or that, that, that is, this is happening. But it also tells you something about the mechanism by which spam is distributed. You couldn't do that if you just make phone calls or if you, if you, if you, you send letters. This re re requires a medium like the internet where you can spread very well. So this for me was always an argument in favor of airborne transmission, uh, that, that you, you can do this. But um, if you, if you look at SARS-CoV-2, the Wuhan version, the old, the original version, had this, this, this property, like spam, that 10% of all the infected individuals were responsible for 80% of the secondary infection. That's non-Personian statistics. And for a Poisson process, if you look at the, the, var the variance in the number of, well, events divided by the average, that should be one. But for a super spreader, which is non-Personian, that ratio is much, much larger, or can be much larger. And, and so here I, I, uh, I unfortunately have to use a parameter that quantifies over, over dispersion. So this is one for Poisson, and if this number k is infinite, it is Poisson, and if it's much less, then it is over dispersed. And so typically for the Wuhan version of SARS-CoV-2, this was around 1.2, I think 0.12. And so then you get a, a variance that is much larger than you get for Poisson. And uh, that is actually for the Wuhan variant. Uh, for Delta, it was, has been determined around 0.5. I mean, all these very rough estimates. And for an Omicron, we don't know yet. But I think it's probably close to, to, uh, to the, uh, the Delta variant. Now, this is basically what happens. This is the probability that... I don't show zero because the people that nobody infected is, is way up there. So one person infected, two, three, etc. This is Poisson. It peaks around the average R, which here I took five, so that's where it peaks. For the super spreaders, it has a very long tail. So it peaks at zero and then has a very long tail. And that has a very important uh, effect. And I'm actually, this is for me interesting. We could treat this problem as almost analytically using uh, the theory of Brown's polymer growth, but that's not important here. This is important. Uh, here you have the, uh, the, the R number. And what, what happens if you say, I allow people to interact with only a certain size, group size? Um, if, you're, if you have a highly overdispersed uh, is a spreading event, so the, the, like the, the wild virus, then here you would have infection, but if you get the group size down to, say, 14 or less, it will no longer, the R will, will be below the, the threshold, so it will stop. Uh, if you have it less over-dispersed, it, it becomes harder, and if, you, if you're down here, which is pretty much where we are, unfortunately, with, with Omicron and Delta, then basically creating bubbles doesn't work anymore. Yes, I, my bell <laughs> is ringing, I know, but I'm almost done. So anyway, that, uh, it, is, it is very uh, very questionable whether creating bubbles, because they always interact a bit, can actually make a difference. Okay, and I said I would, I would conclude here, so I want to show one thing about previous pandemics. This whole thing about airborne transmission, of course, means that people have been wearing masks, and, and I mean, the better the mask, the harder it is to breathe. And so the question is whether people in previous pandemics were stupid. So what do you do if you have something that's very hard to breathe? You try to increase the surface area. And so that is what had been solved long ago. Look, this is a very easy way to increase the surface area. And uh, again, it hasn't been studied. But there is one mask actually in Germany in a museum, and I would love to people to actually investigate what the material is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So <laughs> very nice material science involved here, and uh, with that actually I've come to the end. Uh, I again like to try to ask uh, to thank Sheikh Saud, uh, the advisory board, uh, and of course both the people in the audience and. Uh, and the, the people watching through Zoom, and to end with a cheerful message, which again, in the context of this morning's news, is probably appropriate. 
Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I, I will start with a, a question from the audience. This is Andrew Holmes. Uh, hi, Dan. Last night, Roy Anderson gave a talk to the Athenaeum Club in London and made the point that the best immunity was obtained by someone who had been infected with COVID and has been triply vaccinated. Does this fit the multivalence argument? Um, I, I think that... That, that is something where I would, it certainly doesn't disagree, but this is really the, 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 the biological response of cells to, to, to vaccination of, the, of the, 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 the whole system. So I, th I think it is, it is fine, but uh, I, I cannot say anything either way. I, th I, th I think it, is, uh, it makes eminent sense that the more you prefer. But the, of course, immune response is another typical statistical mechanics problem that I will, that's like Arab Chakrabarty has been working on a lot. So let's. let's this is indeed fascinating to see how these concepts from statistical yeah, they, they carry apply to, uh, to, to, to get a basic yep. understanding of that. That's right. Some other questions. Tony. Thank you very much, Dan. And uh, I know that you've been doing some fantastic work over the last two years on, on this. We talked together in Cambridge. I, I wanted to ask, given all your own sort of detailed analysis and study of what's been going on, do you have a sense as to which countries have adopted the most powerful strategies for combating the COVID and which have been the worst? Um, well, f first of all, I, well, you have to be a bit careful, but uh, I'd say that if you look, in the end, essentially all countries have been affected to some extent, and of course, if you look at completely suppressing the pandemic, at least until now, it has been China that by fairly draconian measures that, that must have cost lives in other ways uh, has been successful. I think that in the end, no country has really been successful in completely suppressing what some countries were good at is to postpone the, the big waves to until they had some vaccines and better treatment methods. And so what you'll find is that uh, in some countries, they, they try to, they manage in to, su to suppress the or original high mortality. And I think that, so having a good health system and good statistics uh, was extremely important. And that was why I found it very depressing that for instance, in the Netherlands, in the outbreak management team, uh, there were essentially no data scientists initially, and, and even now. So, I mean, y y because y you're confronted with something new and you, you have to know what is it, and what's important. And of course, what the typical medical response is, it is like the flu. And so all the measures were de designed to combat the flu and has been incredibly successful. There has been no flu for the past two years, but there has been COVID. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. André? Um. If uh, there would be virologists in this audience, they would be outraged yes. by your talk. Yes. Uh, and there is one thing I would agree with them, uh, because the general wisdom is that one viral particle yeah. or one bacteria is never enough. So they have to have what we now call finer viral load, because yes. there are initial defense mechanism and its viral mm -hmm. particle. I don't know about this. Can, can, I, can I just, can I sort of insult the virologists a bit more? Um, <laughs> the thing <laughs> is that there has been a totally underreported study done uh, in, a, in a group in China together with a few others who did something absolutely brilliant. <clears throat> there was a person who arrived in Guangzhou in, in I think, May uh, 2021 who carried the Delta virus that was, had no symptoms, but after a few days they found. In the meantime, this person had uh, <coughs> infected 92 others. They were all put in a quarantine hotel. They all got a PCR test every single day. But that's not the point. They sequenced the genome every time. Now, the thing is that RNA viruses don't copy very well. So you get a particular virus in, and after the, 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 your disease has developed, you have about 5% of what they, or a few percent, 3 to 5%, of what they call minor variants. Things with a single mutation that doesn't do much to, to the success of the virus. If you transmit your, like your minimal load that the virologists always talk about to somebody else, then you would expect that if that number is 1,000, that there will be about 50 
of the minor variants. They did a nice statistical analysis, and the evidence suggests that one is enough. I have never heard a virologist explain why that is not correct. There is a general wisdom that uh, viruses, and especially bacteria, they have to create a local environment uh, around themselves, and it requires a final number of viruses. Then they, well, that's how they, COVID may be special, but... but I, I uh, think that for bacteria, I buy it instantly. Yeah, for viruses, I think that I, I would, I would very, be very suspicious of generally accepted wisdom.